a very warm uh, good morning to all of you. <clears throat> like I said uh, during the inaugural session, the title of the talk is The Case and Prospects for AI Endowed or AI Enabled Internet. <clears throat> So the focus is, of course, the internet, because it is something that uh, we all use on a daily basis, sometimes 24 by 7, except when we sleep. <laughs> and even then, the phone is working on behalf of you. It keeps receiving things, uh, maybe sending some things automatically back, etc., etc. It is what uh, you know we may call as something indispensable or sine qua non it was already mentioned during the uh, inauguration that it is almost like air, water, etc., etc. It is indeed uh, all of this and maybe more. But I would like to give you a perspective of how important internet is for us, just so that you know uh, it will help us connect AI with those important things in internet. What are the gaps in the internet technologies that AI can address? Especially in the area of security, there is a lot of thing that AI can in fact do to improve the security of internet. As you all do, we pay our bills using internet today, the last maybe 10 years or so. We no longer go and queue up in front of BESCOM or whatever government agencies are. We do it from the comfort of our drawing room and securely, that too. Electricity bill, or water bill, etc. As was mentioned by Dr. Ramani, we do our banking. Of course, there is a flip side. I'll come to that later. We do our banking comfortably from the drawing room again, on the, from the laptop or even from the mobile. We do money transfers at the speed of light. We receive money at the speed of light, et cetera, et cetera. We book our tickets for all kinds of things, for travel, for entertainment, for hotels. And it is done you know, at, at your fingertips very fast and even very optimally. You get the best prices that are possible. And we order services. We get things delivered to our home, which was not possible maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Possible only after a lot of difficulty. But today it's very easy. And you can even track the service at what stage it is, et cetera, et cetera. But as professionals, whatever I told you just now is basically as citizens, you know how we benefit from the internet. As professionals, we benefit a lot by looking at the internet on a daily basis for authentic information, which we need, all of us, when we draft our plans, draft our notes, draft our reports. We all have to refer to the net to just cross-check, to pick up some useful information where there are some gaps. Even to check whether the spelling of a particular word is right or not, today, it's very handy to have internet. I certainly use even a dictionary for that matter quite a lot, not to speak of Wikipedia. And of course, we use it for communicating in variety of ways. I mean, there's, uh, I would say there is, uh, we are spoiled for choice, so to speak. There are so many different ways to communicate, professional communications I'm talking about. 30 years ago, when I uh, sent my first paper to a foreign journal for review, it had to be done using hot copy method, the C-mail, et cetera. And uh, you had to wait for six months, if you're lucky, or one year. And then through C-mail, the comments will come of the reviewers, et cetera. And you just send uh, your rebuttal to the comments or response to your comments, et cetera. And another one year, you know, you will see the hard copy. Today, the scenario has completely changed. For the last 10 years, there's hardly any paper in world. Your draft is ready, you send it through internet. 
comments come also reasonably quickly. And you respond to the comments again very quickly. No C-mail, air-mail business. Everything happens on the internet. Conference proceedings are also totally handled at the inter internet. Submissions are handled at the internet. In fact, the academic world has set a very good example in exploiting internet to the fullest extent for all its activities. And others, in fact, have to follow suit, learn some valuable lessons from the way academic community has started exploiting internet to the fullest extent. It also connects different segments of the people. You all know about social media. Of course, the good and the bad that go with it and how to address the bad is something that we'll have to look at. But it brings about enormous opportunities for people to meet each other, talk to each other, etc. And I would like to especially mention uh, platforms that support meetings of the buyers and sellers. What I talk about is this uh, e-commerce platforms. You're all familiar, Flipkart, Amazon. These would not have been possible but for internet. And these are doing some amazing, in fact, service to general citizens. And what about, uh, you know, the employment opportunities for people at various levels of our society? It ensures that a driver who has come some skills to drive cars is fully utilized. We all, in fact, hire cab drivers in Bangalore. We don't want to suffer this problem of, you know, getting caught in traffic jams and uh, not being able to reach any place in time. And there are these excellent websites, web services that provide you cab on demand, cabby on demand, drivers on demand. And all of us are again very familiar with the delivery boys delivering good food of our choice. And these people earn quite a bit. Without internet, in fact, uh, these opportunities, these employment opportunities would not have been possible. And we should be very thankful that uh, these people get their decent income from delivering these services to us. And not just this, you know, I would say, entry-level employment opportunities. Even tax consultants, doctors, professional consultants, they also, in fact, find internet very handy to reach to their customers, maintain state, highlight their credentials, etc. I can, in fact, go on and on and on. These are just, you know, a few examples that come to my mind in terms of how important internet is. Now, it is because it is so important that we have to really see how to make it even more effective. It, has it reached its state of perfection? No. Not by any stretch of imagination, one can say it has reached really the ultimate state where it can be said it is most perfect. It is addressing, meeting all our requirements. That's indeed not the case. I'll argue how it is indeed not the case. But before getting there, let us look at artificial intelligence. Because we are now looking at artificial intelligence, not only for a variety of things in our country, but also to see how it can improve services on internet, improve the quality of internet, improve above all the security of internet. And that is a huge gap today, even as we speak. So what is artificial intelligence? You know, artificial intelligence is much, much older than internet, that all of you know. In fact, artificial intelligence is even older than computers. Artificial intelligence is as old as the concept of computers, if I may put it like that. The first concept of a computer is the so-called analytical engine. From the name itself, you can guess, you know, it was created for doing mathematical analysis, computations. Computers as a concept was invented, in fact, for relieving us from mental drudgery in the 19th century. Just as how steam engine and later electric motor, in fact, became reality and has completely relieved us of physical drudgery. 
But have computers delivered on the promise of uh, relieving us from mental drudgery? Not yet, I would say. But it is on the right path. But we have to help it along. Computers also, in fact, used to be called, and rightly so, thinking machines. They are supposed to imply uh, thought, implement thought. That how well it has risen to the challenges is something that we will have to debate. We will have to see the gaps. Marvin Minsky, many of you might be familiar, he is simply called Brain the Meat Machine. He said a day will come when there won't be any difference between human brain capability and a computer capability. That is a very good promise and very good ideal that the technologies will eventually realize. But how far we are from realizing that ideal, that is something that we'll have to debate, discuss. Now when we talk about AI, you know, it's a complex subject. First of all, we should know what is natural intelligence. I don't think we have really a very clear idea of what is natural intelligence, how our brains function. In the context of computers, uh, what all computers can do, that is something that uh, we have to reflect on. There is a very famous uh, statement of one of the old computer scientists. Her name is uh, Ada Lovelace. She worked uh, with Charles Babbage, you know, who conceptually developed this analytical engine. They wanted to realize it, but they could not do it fully. But she is supposed to have said, and I completely agree with that statement, computers can do anything you know how to tell them to do it. You cannot just say what they should do, you should tell them how to do it. That's where a program is required. That's the procedural program is required. So technically, if you know that a particular objective can be achieved by following a series of steps, then you can tell those steps to the computer and the computer can do it for you. You don't have to do it. So what is the problem here? The problem is knowing what steps are to be followed to achieve any particular objective. That is where the challenge is. You want to recognize somebody's face, you do it implicitly. The problem with us is, you know, that a lot of our knowledge is implicit, tacit. We really don't know, in fact, how our brain works, not fully yet. Interestingly, the things that we learn in school and college have turned out to be the easiest for computers to simulate and emulate. Whereas things we learn as a child, before we even step into the primary school, those things are proven to be the most difficult for computers to mimic, simulate. I'll come to this point a little later when I talk about the prospects. So we can talk about, for this, you know, AI is a complex thing, as I said. It's, it's about replicating our mental capabilities in computers. So let us factor, you know, this AI maybe into some four domains or something. So that by dividing, we can be able to conquer this domain of AI better. <coughs> People should not say that problem solving is not AI. When you have linear system of equations or a nonlinear equation, or some function, you know, whose optimal value has to be found. Computers are able to do it very fast. You and I cannot do it at the speed at which computers do. Certain things we cannot even do because we don't have that kind of what is called operational memory that is required in our brain. So problem solving is the first layer of AI. Without finding the root of an equation, without finding the optimum value of something, you know, how do you proceed uh, further for an intelligent solution of a real practical problem? So that's the first level. The second level with which a lot of us are familiar is what I may call as knowledge-based systems. You factor the algorithm into two parts. Uh, one part is the knowledge. The other part is the data on which the knowledge is applied to reach some decision, conclusion, some solution, etc. 
So this knowledge uh, in the earlier days, you know, used to be uh, hand coded, hand drafted, hand crafted. So based on our introspecting our mind, we know, okay, this is how I do addition, so that is how the computer will do it. I, I said, if the knowledge is explicit, then we can tell the computer, this is the knowledge, these are the steps to be followed, referring to the knowledge, and then the program is written accordingly. <coughs> But sometimes if the knowledge is implicit, we find it difficult to tell the computer how to do it. But now we have come out with some methods of what are called uh, neural networks or knowledge extraction from data, data mining. Okay, so this is a new development. So knowledge can be still implicit. It can be stored in the form of connection weights in a neural network kind of uh, system. Or knowledge can be extracted, made explicit using data mining algorithms. You are all familiar with uh, algorithms to extract rules, decision trees, once a large amount of curated data, labeled data is available. So all this comes under the category of knowledge-based, rule-based, ontology-based systems. The third level I would like to tell you is where you combine this with Robots. See, ultimately, AI cannot remain static, locked in a computer. It has to move around. It has to fly. It has to swim, go underwater, etc. So, we are talking about unmanned systems, autonomous systems, very important in the context of defense. But these unmanned systems, autonomous systems, they have to have all the capabilities of a knowledge based system. They have to have the knowledge to understand the world, environment understand the environment, understand the obstacles in the environment, and they should be able to navigate. They, have, they need special algorithms to be mobile and not to be damaged in the process of moving and to be able to successfully move from point A to point B and to be able to secure itself also from threats in the environment. So that is the third level, I would say, of, is of AI. The fourth level is the holy grail, if I may say so. That is where we really want the AI system to be like a human brain. Not only it should be able to learn, not only it should be able to create its own knowledge, it should be creative also. It should create new algorithms. It should create new models. It should create maybe new proofs of old theorems. All of us know, you know, how to prove uh, Pythagoras theorem or theorem of the isosceles triangle, etc. But I hope a day comes when uh, AI system of the fourth level will come and tell you, no, no, there is a simpler proof for Pythagoras theorem. There is a more elegant proof for, let's say, isosceles triangle theorem. So. I would reserve uh, the fourth level for that kind of a learning, creating system. The second level that I talked about, knowledge-based system, you know, sometimes can be adaptive. If you have trained that system with uh, 10 speakers and their models, it can recognize one of them when a test speech is given. But there is a method of creating the model. That is given by the professor to the student. You have to implement a Gaussian mixture model, you know. Then the, the student goes and implements that. The computer doesn't have any understanding of what is this Gaussian mixture model. And that understanding is given to the computer by the student. The fourth level I'm talking about, the computer coming up with one, maybe, you know, uh, some, some new model of how to recognize the speaker, how to create its own models. So, AI is a very challenging, exciting uh, domain. And in fact, in the whole country, there is so much of excitement about AI. All the ministries have been tasked to come out with uh, their own roadmap for AI. In fact, DRD also has got its roadmap. MITE has got its roadmap. Uh, Department of Industrial Commerce and Promotion has got its roadmap. Even Cabinet Secretary, you know, uh, has tasked one team to come up with its roadmap. And I only hope that all these roadmaps uh, uh, will not remain just maps, but uh, also will result in some real roads leading to some destinations. <coughs> 
Now, how do we apply AI? The today's uh, conference and my own talk is how to leverage AI, how to make sure AI benefits internet in a meaningful way. There are two ways in which uh, AI can benefit internet. The first is on the application level, you know, how the internet can be more human-like. How we can talk to the internet in a way that it responds uh, to our speech, and it responds back uh, in some audio mode or in some speech mode, etc. I can go on, uh, give some additional examples in due course of time. The second important uh, area where AI can make a huge difference is, like in fact uh, Dr. Ramani mentioned during his talk, uh, when I was listening to him in the morning, he uh, kind of almost anticipated what I would talk. He mentioned about this uh, language translation, that's a very important area. Then he mentioned about face recognition, that's an important area. Then he mentioned about even security, in fact, how to identify fake sources of information. So these are some of the very important areas where AI can help us. Now let me go into details of how application-oriented AI for internet can be conceived and developed. As I said, to start with, you have to think in terms of more efficient, more successful audio processing, speech processing. When I say audio, it's a superset of speech. Okay? Speech processing actually uh, is the first important requirement, even not only for civilians, even for soldiers. They can't be typing on the keyboards. They can't be typing on the you know, uh, pads. Their hands have to be free. They have to hold the guns. But still, they would like to use the computers. So speech is very important. We should be able to ask questions in our mother tongue to our mobile phones, computers, and they should be able to respond back to us in our mother tongue or whatever language you choose in a meaningful way. So that's a starting point. The next thing I would like uh, you to focus. I'm very happy to see a lot of young people are there. You know, whenever we give any speeches, we want these speeches to leave some traces and then grow uh, seeds, you know, uh, to be planted in the mines and these seeds should grow into some trees and some of these ideas should be eventually realized and that's what gives us uh, the purpose of delivering these talks. So the second important thing is image and video processing. It's a huge domain. Facial recognition was mentioned and that belongs to the category of image processing. Now, morning, in fact, one small uh, flower uh, bouquet was given. I think it is probably a rose. I'm not very sure. But sometimes, you know, you are given a big uh, bouquet, with lots of flowers. I don't know whether any of us can really identify each one of those flowers, what they are from, you know, where they have come, etc. I would like a simple application. I just show my camera onto it and it captures the image and tells this is dahlia, this is tulip, this is rose, this is lotus. And in fact, we read sometimes novels, you know, where these flowers are referred to. If you read uh, novels written in England, because we speak English, they'll mention dahlia, tulip, etc. So many of us may not know how these flowers look like. So it would be good to have, you know, a, a simple application that when it sees a picture, it tells you what flower it is. And you can generalize this to anything. Uh, lots of, in fact, the applications are possible when this kind of object recognition is built into your camera. And, and it's happening. But only thing is, the quality of the solution, the accuracy of the solution, they have to be improved. Now I'll tell you about another maybe application. Recognition of people. Let's say, you know, this scenario is quite common. Uh, maybe the uh, wife and children, maybe the wife and son are watching a Hollywood film and the husband comes into the drawing room. Uh, he's not a big fan of uh, Hollywood films, but he still has to make some comment. Otherwise, he'll be considered as a village buffoon. So he looks at the film, but he doesn't know who is the actor. So supposing he has an app in his mobile phone, he 
you know, takes a picture of a snap of uh, that particular screenshot and it labels, oh, this is Marlon Brando. So you casually come in, oh, what is Marlon Brando saying, you know? You can impress your wife and son, oh, that is in fact very much, <laughs> uh, you know, on cue. Possible, very, very elementary, it is possible. <clears throat> but I'll give you a more interesting example. We have a lot of interactions with uh, the Japanese. Uh, we have strategic partnership with them. In fact, I'm glad to say a lot of new projects are also being taken up. Supposing a, <coughs> a Japanese uh, company executive comes to India, <coughs> he sees his uh, friends in uh, maybe Bombay are excited about some cricket match going on, but he doesn't have a clue about what is a cricket match. But he wants to quickly update himself about it. So he takes his mobile phone and uh, looks at a uh, cricket match, a live cricket match, and then the mobile phone recognizes the activities. Huh, this is in fact uh, what is called a spin bowling, off break. It's possible, activity recognition is, in fact already it's happening, but the quality and the accuracy, reliability, they have to be improved. This is uh, a bowler coming very fast in bowling. The mobile app should say, ah, oh, this is fast bowling and he is swinging the ball. Just like how a human expert would be able to say these things. Can a computer actually say these things? I believe it is possible. So when we are talking about image and video processing, AI, for internet, these are the kinds of things internet should be able to do. And from here, in fact, uh, these applications can be generalized for a lot of other very, very useful things, professionally, valuable things. <clears throat> then I come to the next thing, query processing. We ask a query in a natural language. Right now you'll have to type. And even then, you know, we don't get, this. there is a Quora that gives you some answer. I'm not satisfied. Some human being gives uh, some answer and he, his prejudices are there in that answer. I want an objective answer based on standardized knowledge. Query processing is going to be a very important thing. And in fact, when the response comes, you should also uh, be clear that that's a good response. If you have some doubt, you should be able to ask back. How do you say this is the answer? The system should give you an explanation. In fact, last year when I was in Delhi serving in DRDO, there was an AI for all conference. Uh, this uh, was organized by, uh, I think, Niti Aayog, if I remember right. All the ministries uh, sent their representatives. I went from DRDO. It was a very interesting, even Prime Minister and his cabinet members were in attendance. And uh, the NVIDIA chief, Jensen Huang, he gave the keynote address. So he, of course, uh, painted a rosy picture of what all AI can do, how data can be converted into knowledge, etc., etc. Of course, it's a little bit of a, you know, I would say, motivational talk. After he completed his talk, there was a very interesting question. Okay, there is this self-driving uh, uh, lorry that goes and hits somebody and that person is killed. <laughs> Who is responsible? I think this question, uh, you know, clean bowled uh, the, one of the speakers. But the solution is that when something happens, there must be an explanation, detailed explanation based on either recorded data and, of course, based on general knowledge of analysis of the situation. Only after that we can talk in terms of self-driving lorries or self-driving cars. Or there is a doctor who depends on some medical diagnosis system and blindly he prescribes some medicine and the patient becomes ill or becomes dead. Then who is responsible? He can't blame actually the computing system. He has to take responsibility. Why he would take responsibility? Because that system is in fact as smart as him. So we are talking about very advanced medical diagnostic systems. So responsibility fixing is very important in the context of AI, when it is married to internet. See why we are talking about AI for internet? Because internet is here. It is in fact delivering a lot of very useful services to us. When we take AI to internet, there will be that much of extra energy and motivation for developing AI solutions for internet. 
So then the serious responsibility comes along with such development. That is why explainable AI is very important. <coughs> now we come to uh, another important domain which is called common sense reasoning, CSR. Case-based reasoning, common sense reasoning. It's a large part of our brain actually is reserved for what is called a common sense, you know. Uh, somebody who is dead uh, one year back, he's not going to be seen alive later. Same person cannot be there in two places simultaneously. You can't travel faster than light, as a matter of fact, faster than maybe uh, Jet Airways or Air India flight can take you from one place to another place, etc. So there are many of these commonsensical rules. Stone will not fly, pigs will not fly, etc. And we have a large body of knowledge of physics and chemistry. How do we, in fact, capture them in some kind of a uh, representation and make that knowledge available to the computer so that computer can use that also in responding to your queries? This is another great challenge. And finally, when we talk about uh, internet, today, in fact, you know, the scenario is not exciting in terms of how robots are connected to internet, how drones are connected to internet, but gradually, in fact, that scene is also changing. Already we are talking about drones for delivery, right? In certain scenarios, uh, drones can actually make uh, delivery boys uh, redundant. So we'll have to see how we, we can combine robots, drones, etc., with internet. Now we come to the security-oriented uh, AI for Internet. As was mentioned earlier, authentication of the sources, authentication of even IP addresses is very important. Authentication of websites is very important. And many times there may be one small, you know, spelling uh, mistake, spelling, deliberate spelling mistake. And you will not notice it, and that can take you to a wrong website address. But if you have some kind of a, you know, AI-based security solution that does some very simple checks to very complex checks that can alert you, this looks like a fake website. This looks like some spoofed address, etc. It's not easy. The way in uh, internet was developed, security was not thought of. Security was, you know, thought of much later. So as a result, in fact, if there is a spoofed uh, false IP address, it's very difficult for you to trace back. New technologies are required, even at the networking level. And then, of course, AI can come and help you as an interface between you and the system, the internet system. <coughs> now, there are a couple of very important things when it comes to security. One is what is called uh, maintaining the integrity of the devices, functional integrity of the devices. When I say function, it's basically the programs, you know, which transform the data that comes in and gives you the output that is required. But these functions, you know, unfortunately are coming dynamically from outside. So how do you check the integrity of these functions that are coming from outside? How do you ensure the functions that are already preloaded, they retain their integrity? And this is to be looked into. Can AI help here? Maybe to start with some simpler integrity checksum-based, hash-based solutions are possible. But uh, ultimately, you know, these threats come from humans, intelligent humans. So if you put a simple solution, there will be a very smart adversary who would learn some way to bypass that. So therefore, you will have to rope in AI, even in doing something as simple as ensuring functional integrity of the applications in internet, on your mobile phone, on the routers, on the servers, etc. <coughs> and of course, you know, even after there is this guarantee that integrities are preserved, etc., <coughs> there's no guarantee that uh, some penetration cannot happen. There will be somebody, you know, who is not following policy properly, who is not maintaining password policy properly. So intrusions can always happen. You are all familiar with what is called uh, host based, network based intrusion reduction systems. So what is one major problem there? What are called false alarms? And that is where AI is again required. How to minimize the false alarms? Okay. If 
Finally, I come to fake news. It was in fact already referred to, it's a huge problem. <coughs> fake information, fake message, fake video. And when we talk about fake, again it is as old as humanity. <coughs> it's not that fakes are there only because internet has come. Internet has, has made it easy for people in fact to create fake identities, fake entities. Many of us here may know Ramayan, one of our two epics. So there was that golden deer, that was the first very clear description of how a fake can be created and how some very intelligent prince can be duped very effectively. And not just the prince, the princess as well. It starts with the princess and then of course the prince also falls prey to it. But not just that. And subsequently, if you have read Ramayana further, you will notice that Ramana tries to influence her to accept him as uh, her husband by showing a fake head of Rama cut off from his body. Uh, this happens when Sita is, uh, you know, in prison in his palace. But interestingly, one of the Rakshasis who is in fact uh, protecting or uh, safeguarding Sita or uh, helping Sita, she in fact. Uh, advises her, tells her, no, 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 this seems like a fake head, don't believe this. That is how, in fact, Sita is saved from her misery. But the biggest fake of all <coughs> is something that happens during the war. In fact, of all the warriors that uh, Ravana has, the most uh, smart and powerful is his son, Indrajit, that I think many of you may know. He even goes to the extent of in, uh, in <coughs> incapacitating uh, Rama and Lakshmana with uh, the Sarpabana and Garuda comes and, you know, helps uh, Rama and Lakshmana to be relieved of the Sarpabana. But later, subsequently, he in fact creates an illusion of Sita and cuts her into two pieces in front of Rama and Lakshmana. And they believe that uh, Sita is killed in front of their eyes. And they both become dispirited and uh, infinitely sad. And fortunately for them, this Vibhishna, you know, the younger brother of Ravana who has changed sides, he is there. He intelligently tells them, Rama, my elder brother Ravana is so infatuated with Sita, he won't let Sita to die like this. Why don't you understand? So he comes and clarifies that it is a fake. So our uh, Epic has got some very inter interesting, you know, uh, imagination of how fakes are created. How do you respond to them? So it's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. Let us first understand the enormity, the magnitude of the problem. Then, of course, solution will come. Here, I would like to just digress and say, this was also mentioned by Dr. Ramani in his speech. When we talk about any problem, we have to get a very clear understanding of the problem. <coughs> and you'll have to very clearly post the problem. <laughs> Some quote is I attributed to Einstein. I don't know to what extent it is true, because in internet, lots of quotes are attributed to lots of people. Again, you know, the fake problem is there. People will think of something and then say, you know, Mahatma Gandhi said it or Einstein said it, and you have no way of verifying. So uh, Einstein was supposedly have said that uh, if I'm given a problem, and in one hour I have to give a solution, the first to 55 minutes I'll spend in defining the problem. Actually, is very correct. You have to understand the problem from all its dimensions, from all angles. And the more you spend time on the problem consciously, your unconscious starts working, and then you know it is already building the solution. If a solution is feasible, if a solution is not feasible, that is different. So we have to understand the seriousness of this particular problem, fake websites, fake videos, fake news. It is very important, not just for us, it's important for the government, for military, in fact. I'm not going to give a solution here. <laughs> that is, of course, you know, something that uh, the organizers can look into, maybe uh, as part of a, a separate conference. We were talking about uh, some bank uh, executive, pretend somebody pretending to be a bank executive and telling, you know, you do this, you give me your PIN password. 
but uh, most of us are cautious but there are some of us you know who are maybe at that particular point of time emotionally overtaken for due to some reason and they you know unwittingly respond to those kinds of things so how do you prevent these things from happening you can have some kind of an assistant who knows this policy sb also sends you smss no no at no time share any of your passwords account details pins but uh, you know of 1 million customers there may be one or two in fact uh, who do not follow that advice and then as a result uh, some hacking happens some compromise happens so can we think in terms of a uh, you know assistant in the phone which knows this policy and which can quickly you know see the contradiction in the tra transaction between in the conversation between the end user and that uh, so called executive and then point out to the end user no this seems like a fake conversation first of all you know you are not supposed to share this details because there is a policy of sbi probably you have forgotten so these kinds of things are actually needed and i would say dare say it is possible <clears throat> now you might say yeah the case is very strong we have to see how to apply ai on internet but what are the ground realities how far you know we have come how much distance we will have to travel more is the ground ready where are the gaps and that also in fact we have to understand so i'll spend maybe the last 3 4 minutes on prospects of a enabled internet firstly a has been you know uh, researched over the last 100 or even more years but why still there are these gaps there are these problems you'll have to understand that the starting point for understanding that is to have a simple assessment of the average human brain's capability the average human brain is still in terms of its memory and computing power a million times bigger than the best computer that we have in the world some of you may know that we have something like 10 raised to the power 11 100 billion neurons each neuron is a small computing element and each neuron has got about at least on an average 10000 connections to other neurons each connection is something like a byte of memory at the lowest level of assumption so you can see how much memory is there 10 to the power 11 multiplied by 10 to the power 4 that is 10 to the power 15 what is this number called it is 1 peta 1 peta byte so what is the kind of memory today we have in spite of all this in miniaturization etc 1 gigabyte i was just checking the capacity of my phone i have a samsung uh, j6 plus its memory is 4 gb the ram the storage is 64 gb but still it's a far cry from the raw memory that our average brain has but the more serious part is the computing power each neuron as i said is a computing element in 10 milliseconds in fact they can do a threshold value estimation and then decide whether to fire or not each neuron 10 millisecond means you know in one second 100 such calculations can be performed actually each calculation involves uh, a multiplication and addition of the signals coming from what are called uh, presynaptic neurons so technically for each second each cell each neural scale can carry out 10 to the power of 6 floating point operations so 10 to the power of 6 multiplied by 10 to the power of 11 the raw capacity is 10 to the power 17 that is exascale you know 10 to the power of 18 is exascale we are now only talking about uh, peta flops computing systems so in terms of raw capacity of brain average brain i'm not talking about you know uh, super scientists like einstein and all the average human being has got tremendously more hardware and computing capacity than the best computer that are available so that is the reason why though in fact many animals have significantly large number of neurons and uh, interconnections they have not in fact developed 
capabilities like humans have developed. So this may be slightly depressing for you to hear. Oh my God, then we'll have to wait some more time uh, before we can in fact start thinking in terms of AI applications. Fortunately, it is not required because we can define domains, self-contained, close to domains, in which a specific cap capability can be developed and incorporated into our mobiles and phones. So that is actually the hope. There is also this thing called a time memory trade-off that uh, some of you may be familiar. See, one important thing when it comes to AI is the responses must be quick. You see somebody's face, immediately you'll have to respond. Okay, he is X and hello, Mr. X. You can't record his face and go uh, somewhere else. Ten minutes later, you come and want to shake hands with him. <laughs> He's not going to be there. So instant responses are required. So time memory trade-off is something that one can look at. AI-enabled applications, components, they are available. In fact, as was mentioned by Dr. Ramani, there are these translators available. Uh, YouTube, for example, you know, if there is a Hindi film song, you uh, do this auto-translation mode. Only thing is, uh, the auto-translation will think it is an English song, and then it will translate the Hindi into, uh, you know, the equivalent English, which, is, which will be gibberish. So even that minimum intelligence, this is not English, this is, you know, Hindi, that is lacking, if I may say so. But I'm not yet getting into the accuracy of the translation. So they, these are very small prototypes. But we are on the right track. There is this Google Assistant which is listening and, you know, responding. Uh, there is uh, good uh, speech translation available. In fact, I recently was in Moscow. Before retirement, I was uh, for three days in Moscow. And there, uh, people don't speak English. They hate English, perhaps. So you don't find English names anywhere. And uh, even to the cabbies, in fact, uh, uh, you have to speak in Russian. And first time goer, or even a second time goer who doesn't know Russian, will find it extremely difficult to navigate in uh, Moscow. But this Google Translator came handy. The driver, in fact, switched on that. and. I speak in English to him, and then he translated uh, things into Russian, and he understood. And the quality was apparently good, because we were able to get along and reach our destination, not just one, multiple destinations. So things are there. Things are growing. Scope is widening. The accuracy is improving. The depth is uh, also getting enhanced. And there is this uh, deep learning. Some of you might have heard about it. There's a lot of euphoria uh, that is partly hype, partly reality. But it will, of course, come down from the you know hype that it is enjoying to some equilibrium level. But it's a good technology for image and video processing, if I may say so. So you can look at that technology for developing the kind of capability that I was talking about earlier in terms of image and video processing capabilities. So there is a lot happening, a lot of promise. And so, in the next 10 years, I think some of the things that I explained to you may become a reality. I am very confident. And we will, of course, go uh, much further after 10 years. So I just conclude my talk on that positive note. I thank uh, the organizers, especially Dr. Ganga Prasad and Dr. Balaji Rajendran, uh, coordinating my visit and hosting me here. Thank you very much.